Okay, it's one past eight here in Germany. I welcome everyone. Hello. Uh, not only good morning, but also good day and good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where I, you are joining us from. Welcome to the Science Policy Forum for Biodiversity from the International Union of Biological Sciences, the IUBS. I am Simon Häusler from uh, the German Association of Biologists, VBIO, and uh, we're doing this in cooperation and I'm handling uh, the Zoom today for all of us. Uh, I'm quickly introducing a few things and how this is running. So for all your questions, you can use the Q&A function of Zoom while the speakers are already uh, giving their talks. You can type in your question. Before you ask a question, you can also check if a similar question or your question is already being asked. Uh, if this is the case, please just like that question and we are going to prioritize the questions by their likes. If you want to say thanks uh, in the very end or have comments, uh, also feedback, you can use the chat box. I will activate it in a moment. And um, while Carl Josef is going to introduce the speakers and uh, the IUBS, I'm going to run a live poll with you to see where you are joining us from and what your professional occupation is. So it, I would be happy if you would just click the boxes and I will show the results just before the first talk is going to start. I'm looking forward to the talks and handing over to Carl Josef. Okay, thanks a lot, Simon. Um, um, so he already said that it's um, being run in collaboration with the German Life Science Association, VBIO. But I would like to introduce the International Union of Biological uh, Sciences and why we are doing this Science Policy Forum for Biodiversity this week. Um, so today we have a very interesting, to our opinion, very important topic, invasive alien species in Asia and Oceania. And um, before we start with these talks, I like to present um, IUBS. So um, probably you have heard it, probably, I hope so. Um, we were established 105 years ago, 1919. And nowadays we have 110 national scientific and institutional members, as you can read here. So, for instance, national academies or uh, international scientific association and societies. So um, what are we doing? This is just um, a shortcut of what we are doing. So here it's written priorities and main areas of work. So we run scientific programs. It's more seed funding. It's not a huge amount of money we can provide. But this seed um, activity is extremely important. So nowadays, programs are run on biodiversity in health big data. I think that is very clear that this is very important. In fact, tomorrow we are going to have a seminar on digital sequence information, and that is directly related uh, to this topic. Um, I should be faster, maybe. You see here the Science Policy Forum Bi for Biodiversity. And I will uh, give an explanation why we are doing this webinar today. Um, you see here that we have a program um, running on pastoralism and the socio-ecological consequences, which is also very important because many people on, on the globe, on the earth, depend on uh, this income for uh, um, uh, food, feed, and, and um, um, yeah, their family. And then naturally, this is a very important topic. We started with this before Corona, but zoonotic diseases are a very hot topic, I think, if we think of biology. And I didn't mention International Union of Biology wants to be the global voice of biology. You see here, that is one of the old activities, but still very important, a unified science language and taxonomy. So we were always engaged and are still, are still advising in context of uh, phylogenetic trees and nomenclature. Um, 
Nowadays, um, there is a new uh, decade of science for sustainable development. This was the International Year for Basic Science for Sustainable Development, where we were a lot engaged and now we should change, but they don't have apparently a logo. I also checked yet. So now we have the international decade um, of a research, basic research, um, a science research for sustainable development. Then we are a lot engaged in education. And I think this is a major outreach of IUBS. Here you see climate education, this drop ICSO issue, and education in ecology is a program that is run right now. So we are also engaged in gender equality and equal opportunities. And um, what you can see here in, at the bottom, sorry, it's more almost hidden. We collaborate with a lot of other organizations and international unions. And we sorted it according, let's say, to the importance. Maybe then UNESCO should be first. And then the um, Convention for Biological Diversity or the International Science Council. And I mentioned here the International Union for Waternary Research because that is an example how we collaborate for support of early career scientists. So that was a very short introduction. Naturally, one could talk about each topic much longer. Now, why? Um, this um, webinar series. Um, this year in October, we in, in fact starting, I think, on the 20th of the October, running until uh, November, there will be um, the um, meeting of the, uh, the COP of CBD. And um, in the middle of this COP um, is uh, the Science Policy Forum for Biodiversity from the 26th to 27th. And this is going to take place in Colombia, in Cali, which is a huge city, apparently. And what you can see here, these are the other science fora we were um, involved in. So IUBS always um, managed uh, the science forum um, at the COP of CBD. And um, that is why we thought we should start maybe in preparing views, start the discussion by uh, having this online event that starts today. So we have one event today, Invasive Alien Species, as I mentioned before. Then tomorrow, um, and at another time, in fact, uh, Central European time, three o'clock, we will have um, a discussion about digital sequence information in biodiversity research and how to share benefit. That is a hot topic right now, because I think science depends and basic research depends a lot on digital sequence information. We will hear later on. And then on Wednesday, we have um, ba -ba, we have um, um, a webinar on indigenous people in conservation uh, of biodiversity. And probably the 11th April on indicators it will not take place, I assume. OK, good. Um, that is more or less what I wanted to say. Now the poll uh, uh, showed up, and I should place it somewhere else, maybe. I don't know whether you saw it. And um, I would uh, continue with introducing the moderator of today. And so I'm very happy that Noriaki Murakami um, from Japan um, agreed on organizing today's webinar. He's an expert in uh, species um, phylogeny. He works at um, uh, Tokyo Metropolitan University and is a curator of Makino Herbarium. And he is a taxonomist, as he um, is stating in his uh, bios. And um, what is important, he is using a lot of DNA information to reconstruct phylogeny. And uh, I was very happy to see that he used the large subunit of Rubisco long time ago to reconstruct part of uh, fern um, phylogeny. And he has also a lot of interest in cryptic species. Um, so I would hand over now to Noriaki. Noriaki, thank you very much, Noriaki, said you took over this um, duty. And um, then I ask you to manage the webinar. Thank you. OK, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. OK, uh, so uh, thank you for attending the IUBS webinar. Uh, in, invasive alien species in Asia and Oceania and the measures for them. I'm Noriaki uh, from Makina Havarium. 
uh, invasive alien species pose a significant threat to biodiversity conservation worldwide. And uh, some of the current problems associated with invasive alien species in biodiversity conservation includes uh, habitat degradation and fragmentation of native species, altered ecosystem dynamics, genetic pollution through hybridization with native species, a disease transmission to native species and others, and the globalization facilitated the an intentional introduction of invasive species through trade and travel. Uh, effort to control the spread of invasive species are complicated by uh, international trade network and the movements of uh, good and people. So addressing these issues required uh, coordinated efforts at the local, national, and the international levels. Include, uh, including uh, preventions, early detections, uh, eradication, and the management strategies for invasive species. And in addition, uh, public awareness and education are essential uh, to minimize the unintentional um, introduction and the spread of invasive species, and so promote biodiversity conservation efforts. In this webinar, uh, we have three specialists of invasive alien species, the Professor Ravinda Kori, Professor Ian Dickey, and Professor Masahito Yoshida. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we, uh, we're discussing uh, these issues uh, with participants. So shall I move to the uh, presentation? Oh yeah, okay. I should stop now, yes. Shall I stop the presentation, right? Mm, okay. So, Professor Cody, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Should I start? Oh, so, oh, OK. Yeah. Uh, so please share your slides. So I will take the time just to tell you what the audience is. So we have uh, researchers oh. from academia, educators, bachelor, master, and PhD students. There's uh -huh. science professionals also from industry. Uh, the people are coming from Africa, Asia, Australia, and Oceania, Eastern Europe, and Western Europe. Oh. And now I'm looking forward to the first talk. Thanks. Okay. It's, 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 thank you for attending from the all the world. And uh, yes, uh, the first speaker is the Professor Lavinda Kori, Amity University, Punjab, Mohari, India. And the title of his uh, presentation is Invasion of Alien Plants in India, Implication and the Suggested uh, Remedial Measures. Rabinda, uh, whenever you are ready, please start. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nariyaki. Mm. And uh, from India, good day to everyone in the meet. Thanks to the IUBS for giving me an opportunity to talk on the topic on which I have been working since 1980. Soon after my PhD, I am a biochemist, but turned into an ecologist. Uh, in, the, in the process, we could publish around six or seven, you know, edited books on invasive plant species from CRC, Springer, and Xavier, etc. I have divided my this talk into three parts. First one is general for especially the non-ecologists. And then what is the situation in India? That is the second part. And third part pertains to way forward and what are the recommendations, how we can manage it. I believe we all admit that invasion of plants or animals or even man is not a new phenomenon. However, the rate at which the invasion is taking place is phenomenal. It is considered to be a cause of extinction even more than that of the climate change. 
IPBES with its headquarter in Germany. This is the second leading cause of species extinction after the habitat loss. Very serious issue. The reasons, largely, as per the IPBES, these are largely the anthropogenic. I beg to a bit, a differ a bit, but largely it is so. You know, because of better connectivity, improved import export system, better transportation, industrialization, tourism, opening up of economy, everybody wants to become rich. And in that context, little realizing that the appended, you know, things are also coming along with our development. These are facilitated by the climate change, consequential change in the weight pat patterns, velocity, distribution of propagules, and lack of predators. And the result is, we are towards near globalization, near homogenization of biota. Thereby, more prone to impacting biodiversity, ecosystem integrity, and the whole ecological relationships. We are already seeing the change in distribution and diversity of native vegetation. At least in India, I have been observing it for the last many years. Thus, with the plants, the impact is direct on the dependent fauna and the dependent pests, insects, etc., microbes, even the soil. It rightly said by Dr. Carl that there is a, it is a very important topic. Therefore, the recent attention, attention at the global level is devoted to invasive species. CBD, Convention on Biological Diversity, they declared 2009 as the International Year of Biological Invasion, realizing the importance of this issue. And this ITDES, thereafter, you know, after, after the declaring 2009 as the by the CBD on invasive species. There was an effort at the global level to have an independent intergovernmental body, which initially it was not declared by the UN, but later in 2012, it in the, in the plenary session, the UNEP adopted this as a resolution. The, its headquarters is in Bonn, Germany, and the next plenary session, as per the email I received, is in December in Namibia. Namibia. And ITBS adopts top to bottom approach. Therefore, there are some of the scientists who are unable to represent their, their activity. Now, before I talk of invasion in India, let me say a few words on the technical terms which are most often used in the seminar. Native or indigenous species means those, their site of origin is that place, that area. All the exotic or aliens, the site of origin is different and the establishment is different. Of course, in the site of origin also, but if they are in the uh, outside the area of origin. Naturalized species, those which in the new area, they are self-replacing. Their new generations are coming and they are establishing. Invasive, those who are from outside their area of origin and they cost the other species. If they impact the other species and invasive alien species, likewise the same, if they are from outside the area of their presence. Most of the species which we talk of and which IPBES also admits, these are introduced by man. 
I am, you know, whenever I teach to my students, I relate it to the invasion by man. Invasion does not necessarily mean with the use of swords or with guns. It is even otherwise also. So in Europe or in America, everywhere, we find people from other continents, they are established and they are, I call them as invaders. They have invaded. Now the question comes, how to know that a species is originated in the area or is an exotic species? This is a major big question. And the answer is not that easy. But there are three possible ways. One is paleontological data that can, you know, clearly state whether the area of origin, which is the area of its origin, but it is a difficult, very difficult option. Second is biogeographical range. But here also, there is a problem. We cannot be so precise and sure. The way we, I find that in India, whenever we talk of, we say about the Depirocars, whether they have come from Malaysia to India or from India they have gone to Malaysia. We cannot say. And the third possibility, alternative possibility is the genetic diversity as proposed by N.I. Vavilov, a Russian scientist. Invasion starts with introduction, irrespective of the means and mode of introduction. It starts with introduction, then gets colonized, in that area and then naturalized establishment. So the forces that govern the success of any invader are either its intrinsic factor, its own genetic makeup, size of the seed, number of seeds, ecological amplitude, whether on a high pH or a low pH, one can, these species can sustain or how much is the temperature range, ecological amplitudes I am talking about. And second, of course, is the extrinsic factors. There are, the, the, whenever we talk of any species, we look at the reasons why they are established. So there are two theories about it and both are, both are mutually inclusive. One is theory of balance of nature. Interactions within the community with different populations, maybe competition, allelopathy, predation, parasitism, etc., or multi species equilibrium. Ecological principle relates to equilibrium status. So, species, they automatically go in for equilibrium. And the second is that nothing, the second school of thought says that there is nothing like equilibrium. It is the individual, individualistic, individual's, you know, uh, strength that brings in the level of success. Both the theories, as I just said, they are mutually inclusive. Actually, the fact remains that most of these species, it's the get introduced in a new area. They get established because of intense disturbance of the ecosystem. So the level of success depends how disturbed the system of the area is. Now I'll be shifting now to the second aspect of the situation in India. It is a very serious situation that is coming up. India, as we all know, of the 36 biodiversity hotspot zones, India has four. These four biodiversity hotspot zones I have shown. And it ranks among the top 10 species rich nations. On one side, we say that we are species rich. 
we have a lot of diversity. On the other side, we say that we have four hotspot zones. The presence of hotspot zones brings in our attention to the issue of loss of biodiversity, the speed of loss of biodiversity. So we have four and the invasive alien species is one of the five drivers of biodiversity loss. You know, this Western Ghats is one, one of the hotspots. The whole of Himalayan region extending from Pakistan, this is all the hotspot zones. And the third is Indo-Malayan region, Malaysian region, and the Sunda land. In India, when I try to categorize the types of species, we find that many of the plants, trees, are enclosed by man. Trees, example, eucalyptus, eucalyptus or populus, popular in English we call it, these were introduced. And likewise, the purposeful introductions for beauty, they are Lentana Kamara, it was brought in India by Lord Cornwallis of London, England, and it was for its beautiful flowers. It has escaped from the botanical gardens to the forests, and now it is one of the 10 most noxious species available in 85 countries. Then likewise, Agiratum conicidis, this is this violet colored flowers, Prosopis juliflora, Mycenia macrantha. During the Vietnam War, US Army brought it for camouflaging the army installations. And it is from there that it escaped and entered India. Now it is a serious issue with us. Likewise, Aishodnia, aquatic, plant. These were introduced and they have now become problematic weeds. On the other hand, there are a few like Parthenium hysteroforus, Congress grass and Eupetonium, they invaded accidentally. India is one of the 12 mega centers of origin of cultivated plants. And as I always said, four biodiversity hotspots. We unfortunately do not exactly know how many are the total species which are invasive aliens? There are reports. The latest report says that there are 54 terrestrial uh, invasive plants and eight aquatic. This is the report of 19, uh, 2019. And it says, this, this I have already evaluated, that 18% of the Indian flora is non-native. And majority of them have come from south, southern USA or not part of the US continent. 55%, Eurasia 15%, Arc Africa 11 and from Asia 19. It, it was in 1990 that government of India entrusted with PA with me with a you know, prestigious fellowship award, BP Paul National Fellowship Award by the ministry. In that, I was asked to work on the invasive plant load in the Himachal Pradesh. Himachal Pradesh is the western part of Himalayas, and Chandigarh is close to this Himachal Pradesh. So I was given the task, and it was a very big task. I took it and we, you know, ground to think, ground realities. We wanted to look at it. I could find that in that, that area, there were about 95% in, in 1990 and in 15 years, the native plant's vegetation has reduced by 5% in just 15 years. 
of the alien plant species three agitatum conizoides parthenium hysterophorus and lentina camara they constituted around 10% of the whole population and it was 70.6% of total exotic plants it means majority of pressure was from these three species and incidentally all these three species they their site of origin is american continent the why invasives are more successful because they can understand wide ecological they can withstand wide ecological amplitude competitive advantages to them lack of pest and predators all these plants which which i have just shown there is no natural pest natural insect to eat away and then strong reproductive and regenerative potential of these plants all these invasive plants they are strongly allelopathic they release chemical substances into the environment and these chemical substances are toxic for others so this is a competitive advantage to the invading species of course we can't discount climate change is also one of the reasons and altered soil conditions these plants they change the soil conditions to suit them these mycenia was introduced as i just said to camouflage and lentena camara in 1809 in calcutta agiratum was brought as an ornamental plant in 1882 and parthenium in 1950s it came in 1950s this is the stance of parthenium this these are slides from chandigarh the area where i am this is the chandigarh to delhi highway it has a you know as i just said wide ecological amplitude it can complete its life cycle in 6 to 10 weeks temp air temperature range 22 to 35 likewise you know its means of spread is through seeds which are very small seeds and very light seeds there are certain these you know trichome like structure you might be finding some hair like growths these come into the atmosphere they stick on the human body open sort open body because of sweat they stick and there is parthenin like chemical substance that gets entered into the body and the body starts reacting itching etc so as i just i have shown that around 25000 seeds per plant and they are very light in weight you know this type of problem you know skin skin problems they come in and it causes famine you know uh, famine for this uh, cattle cattle feed grasses are not available and cattle doesn't feed on it insects doesn't eat it so this is a condition like famine like condition and even in the milk of cattle we could find this parthenin i am not going into that direction otherwise it becomes a different lecture so it disturbs the food chain food web the whole cycle the ecological principles all get impacted causes allergy in human beings also this is the cycle in which it works seed bank in the soil and those who survive survival is a crucial factor favorable climatic condition in a year four times it can has its its cousin four times in a year so they germinate competitiveness adaptability absence of natural enemies allelopathic defense so that way they make a monospecific stance and from this monospecific stance the other new new stance they come up we studied that the simpson's index of dominance look at it the most dominating plant in himachal pradesh during my study was this parthenium hysterophorus why it is not moving yeah 
Another is agitatum conizoides. This is also the same. This is around Chandigarh in the Haryana area and some in Chandigarh itself. This is, this is we call it as a billy goat weed. Uh, it has a smell like that of sheep. And this also, it, you know, parallel to Parthenium that, that I showed. And this is Parthenium as well as this plant, they are the uh, weeds of the wasteland or uh, disturbed land. Its seeds are also very small and they can float long distances. Factors that impact, that, that contribute uh, to the success of agitatum is annual spread through stolons as well as through seeds. Seed dispersal is very efficient. It, is, it, it has a very strong competitive ability, outcompetes the native vegetation. And there are also chemical substances into it, phenolic acids, which do not allow other plants to come nearby. And the problems associated, if it affects the animal health, the whole ecological system, it impacts. It impacts even the human body, as well as the economy of the area. This also has very rich index of dominance compared to other plants. Yeah. Lentana, as I just said, it is one of the noxious weeds in 85 countries of the world. And this invites forest fires also. It is a weed of the forest. It was brought by Lord Cornwallis in Calcutta. So this also has rich Simpson index of diversity. I don't know why these slides they stick when it comes to tables. I don't know. Yeah. Now I am shifting my attention, keeping in mind the time schedule, shifting my attention to the invasive trees, trees or woody vegetation. It is much more serious compared to even the herbaceous plants. Herbaceous plants is serious because of the you know, spread and density. This is important because of the large size. They are ecologically dominant. They have huge biomass, huge seed waste, difficult to manage. And this leads to drastic change in the community structure. In any area, wherever these plants they grow, they bring in a lot of change in the ecology and ultimately impacts biodiversity very severely. And we, there, is, there is controversy as regards the number of invasive tree species. Of course, they have increased worldwide, how many types they are of, there is a controversy as per the global invasive species that are raised. These are 140. And I am taking this for my all, you know, research. When I look at these 140 tree species and assign them the families to which they belong. And I find that except for this uh, Pinaceae in Gymnosmoth, which has only one family. Others, they have more number of invasive plants. Maximum is that of Fabis. And other of these, uh, they, these you know, other, other families like Poaceae and Dubiaceae, etc., they have one plant seed. In Pinaceae, there are eight species, number of number of alien species. Categorize, I, when I look at that, how do they spread? In the IPBS, they say that it is only the man who is responsible. I say no. They spread through seeds and in the next slide it will be vectors for it. Majority of the dispersal is through the seeds 
and followed by seeds and suckers. And reasons of introduction of many of these trees is because of ornamental value or usefulness of the wood, etc. Their distribution in the globe, Australia, uh, sorry, Asia, AS stands for Asia, 43 of these 140 tree species, tree or woody subspecies. Australia, North and South America, South America, North America, North America, 11. And then, likewise, others are, you know, uh, the, the number of species, the origin of which is Africa is only five, Australia and Australia, uh, Australia and Asia six, etc. The vectors for the dispersal of these invasive species are birds and wind. Majority of the reasons. In India, there are 36 of these 140 species, 36 species of trees and woody shrubs. Of these, I have brought before you three, deliberately three. This Prosopis juliflora, belonging to Mimosis family. Its origin is in South America, and it is from the Mexico and Peru. It has come to tropical America, as well as to India, Australia, Indonesia. In India, we have declared it as a noxious VD plant in the whole of Gujarat, western, western part of India, Gujarat and Rajasthan. There it has created havoc like conditions. The second I have brought before you is Drosonesia which belongs to Modesi family. And its origin is Eastern Asia, China, and Kota. This is called paper mulberry or Japanese mulberry also, they call it. It's naturalized in Asia, Europe, and USA. And it is a neo-invasive, new invasive in India. In our botanical garden, we spotted few plants of this. Immediately, we took note of it. Outside the boundary of the university, there were around 100 such plants. Inside the boundary, there were about five or six plants. So we uprooted them from the botanical garden, as well as from the outside the university campus. Realizing that if we allow it there in the botanical garden, it will impact other native species and then there, thereby it will become difficult for us to control it. Then the third one is Delbergia sisu, which is, we call it shisham. It is an Indian tree. This Indian tree has gone to, from Indian subcontinent. It is now invasive in USA, African continent, Australia, Indonesia, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Taiwan, Taiwan and Israel. It is not, it is only the invasion in India. Indian plants are also invading other places. So, looking at these 140 species, I was trying to evaluate the path of their journey. So, as per the, 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 the knowledge we have that there are seven ecosomes, we, we can't assign any particular place for the species as the place of its origin. It is the ecological zones. And these ecological zones are pale Arctic, then Neo-Arctic, Neotropic, Afrotropic, Indo-Malayan region, and Australasia, and of course, Oceania, this area also. So I try to put the plants their availability and the area of origin. What I could find that this side, this horizontal side, is the species native of, let us say 40 species are native of pale Arctic 
this China, India, and Europe area. 40. Knee Arctic 30, Neotropic 16, likewise. And in the vertical side, I have given species invaded two. Species which have invaded to Pale Arctic, Neo Arctic, etc. And in that context, I find that majority of Pale Arctic, they, they have invaded, species of Pale Arctic have invaded majority, the other tropic areas. And the same is in case of indo malayan region. When I look at horizontally, it is the Nearctic, Nearctic American continent, which has been invaded to the most. Same is the case of Afrotropic regions. Now the Third aspect, way forward, what is to be done? I am looking only from the point of view of India. India have become, has become a favorable adobe for the nascent plants like Agilatum, Lantana, Prospis, Parthenium, Prospis, Zuliflora, Micrantha, etc. Incidentally, they are all from tropical America. And woody plant species, majority from Indo-Malayan region and Pale Arctic region, have been relatively more. Plant invasions from these areas have been more, while these have been invaded the least after Oceania, but impacted the most in India. Neo-Arctic and Afrotropic have been invaded the most. Oceania has invaded the least, but invaded by these have not only displaced the native species in India, but also deteriorated the quality of native ecosystem. This is very disturbing for me. Now, I am trying to focus my attention, diverting my attention and inviting the attention of the world, not to those species which have already established. We can't do anything with them. It is a very difficult task. Let us focus on those species which are new so that wherever we can put a halt, that is possible. So in India, I am trying to work on invasive species, Rosanacea. I don't want these species to invade the hotspot zones. Otherwise, the biodiversity which is already affected there will be affected to a large extent. I want to put a halt on it. So, Prosonacea, Tegetes, Minuta, Lucina, Leucocephala, Hyptis, Hyptis has come from southern India to our area. They have, they, I don't want them to become troublesome. So, my, some of the recommendations to the Indian government has been that we need to develop, and this is applicable for everybody, for any, any country. We need to develop a national database, which most likely in most of the places is missing. And more importantly, we need to focus on neo-invasive plant species. We need to generate awareness among the masses. Without this contribution of masses, it is difficult for any country to manage these invasive plants. Augment the capacity and control and regulation of IES, invasive alien species, especially at the entry points. It is already being taken care of in New Zealand. New Zealand is one such area, country, where there is very strong, very strong regulatory mechanism for IES. And we, in India, I am always talking about the, the, the actions taken by the New Zealand. So we need to translate these actions in other areas. That is what is my recommendation. We need to understand the path of entry and invasion of all species. We need to seriously develop effective site eradication procedures and employ 
multi-year treatments, continued monitoring and follow-up, early warning, rapid and risk assessments, management methods need to be further developed. We should not sit idle. We must think of developing these mechanisms. Effective mechanisms of mass removal of IES from the especially from the uh, protected area networks, forests, wetlands, etc. We need to promote intersectoral linkages to check unintended interruptions and contain and manage the spread of IES. We need to restore restoration measures, focus on them, and understanding the biological and ecological attributes of IES. We are required to determine the socioeconomic and ecological impacts of IES. It is only the socioeconomic system which politicians they understand. Otherwise, they don't give much attention to this inv invasive, uh, uh, you know, uh, problem of invasion. We need to strengthen and integrate the eco-friendly approaches and devising preventive measures for areas free of invasion. The, here I, 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 I share with you key success stories in very brief, very, very brief. You know, we all understand that individually we cannot manage, we cannot control invasion. We need to have long-term strategies in place we are already late, but more delay needs to be avoided in making those statuses. We should have national and global partnership and collaborative joint actions. You know, this NSF from US, Dr. Karol Horowitz, she invited me for having this partnership for controlling these invasive species. So I went there, discussed with her. We were interested in controlling Lentana. Because if I control Lentana from India or Parthenia, or for that matter, any species from India in the neighboring Pakistan or in the neighboring Sri Lanka or in Bangladesh or these countries, these invasive propagules will again come. We need to do it in the whole eco-zone. So it did not fructify because she wanted me to focus on Melaleuca. Melaleuca is a problem in Florida, not anywhere in India. So I wanted that we should select a species which is more problematic, more number of places, more number of countries. So it didn't mature. But here in India, what we did in the Napoli forest and Samba area in JNK, in Samba area JNK, Many terrorists used to come and hide in, in the Lentina infested area. So, government of India instituted an eco task force to get rid of Lentana. We get, got rid of Lentana and planted the native plants. Likewise, in Apni forest, we removed Lentana and planted native plant Vasaka. It worked very well. Now, there is no such uh, Lentana in that Napni forest. Likewise, in Rosonesia, I just shared with you that uh, in botanical garden, we could get rid of this Rosonesia and the surrounding areas. And in case of Parthenia, we talked to the government and saw to it that there should be no land which is vacant, no disturbed ecosystem. So we should put all the lands to use land and will not come. Sorry, I am sorry, Lentinari, Parthenia will not come. So this way we have small areas, but very good success. We should augment the existing capacities to control and regulate the port of entry, develop regulation for the regular monitoring of nurse, the nursery outlet. This is also very important. And uh, we should make the public aware and involve them in not letting neo-invasives invade our areas. With these words, I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to say something about this. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Cory. 
I'm sorry, but uh, you run out of your time. <laughs> 25 I'm minutes sorry. and the 10 minute question. So, uh, so, so, so uh, maybe we will discuss later, but uh, shall, I, shall, shall I move to the second talk? Please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I'd like to uh, move to the second talk. Uh, the present second uh, speaker is Professor Ian Dickey, uh, University of uh, Canterbury, New Zealand. And the title of his talk is uh, Linked Plant Fungal Invasions and the Implication for Management in the Context of New Zealand. Ian, can you share the slide? Unfortunately, slide? unfortunately I can't. I've just had my uh, screen sharing disabled. Simon, can you help me with that? Oh, Simon. Yeah, it should be. I should just be saw that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that should be shown. So thank you very much for the invitation to talk. Um, just fix one thing here. So I'd like to talk to you about a little bit of um, my experience in New Zealand, particularly looking at linked plant fungal invasions and some of the implications of that for management. Um, so New Zealand is just put the context here. New Zealand is perhaps the most isolated country in the world. If you take a look at the globe with New Zealand in the center, it's pretty much all ocean around us. And as a consequence of that isolation, we're also one of the um, biodiversity hotspots, which we've already heard about a little bit. Um, New Zealand is a somewhat unique hotspot in that we actually have the lowest plant diversity of any of the global hotspots, only around uh, 2,300 or 2,400 species of plants in New Zealand, but we have the highest level of endemism. So 81% of those plants are found nowhere else on earth. And because of that, we end up hosting about 0.6% of the global plant biodiversity. That the um, ecosystems in New Zealand were originally largely forested. So grasslands and shrublands occurred above tree line, and then there was pretty dense native forest below tree line. And it stayed that way until the arrival of humans around 1260, and then the later arrival of Europeans um, a couple hundred years later. And through Maori and uh, European burning, we've generated these sort of novel ecosystems. Um, this is one of the iconic novel ecosystems open spreading grasslands that have a huge cultural uh, significance and are really part of our image of what New Zealand should look like. Unfortunately, those grasslands are also highly invadable. And so they, they are um, filled with gorse, broom, wilding pines, briar rose, exotic grasses, hawkweed um, coming in more and more. If we look at the, the New Zealand situation as a whole, then we've got about 2,400 indigenous plants, 81% of which are endemic. We have an amazing 24,000 established alien plants in the country, of which more than 2,500 have become invasive. So our invasive flora is larger than our native flora. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to do in today's talk is focus on one of those species, which is invasive pines. Um, and sort of use that as a system to talk about invasions and, and some of what you can get when you dive into them deeply. So this is going to be about 15 years of research on the drivers and impacts of pine invasion, in terms of mycorrhizal and uh, fungi, but also their impacts on ecosystems. And then I'll try to end by linking that back to some management and policy sides. So this is an independent report that came out last year um, looking at the extent of pine invasion in New Zealand. So in the left-hand picture, you can see it um, all through the blue areas, very widespread through the mountainous areas of the country. And they predicted that if we didn't uh, control it, it would very quickly reach incredibly high densities across most of those regions um, and occupy a significant portion of the country, in pretty much all of those grasslands that I showed you earlier. That's quite extraordinary. And the reason I find it extraordinary is we worked really, really hard to get pines to grow. When um, early last century, people tried to plant pines all throughout the Southern Hemisphere in New Zealand, Australia, this particular picture is Patagonia, um, South Africa. 
And they had a very, very difficult time planting them and getting pines to thrive. And as recently as the 19, 1976, authors were writing about the trouble of getting pines to establish. So this was by an author by, Nick, by the name of Nick Ledgard, who wrote that the poor establishment of tree seedlings was due in part to a lack of mycorrhizal development. And that he actually recommended that we should be inoculating the seed with mycorrhizal fungi in order to get better establishment of pine. Mm -hmm. Just a quick reminder, what are, what are mycorrhizae in case anyone's forgotten? So mycorrhizae are a symbiotic mutualist associ mutualistic association between fungi and roots. The fungus envelops the plant root and takes nutrients from the soil and brings it back to the plant. And these involve a huge diversity of fungi, thousands of species, and also many, many species of trees. So to better understand what's going on with pine, I went out, this was one of the first studies I did, looking at both uh, invasive pines and native beech, and then using DNA techniques to pull out, look at individual roots and identify what fungi were present. This graph is impossible to read, but what I want you to see in it is just the amount of blue bars in it. And there's this large, diverse community of fungi found on our native beech, um, in total about 96 species. Up at the top, you see the red bars. Those are those fungi that were found on pine. And I'll just enlarge that so you can see it. So that's it blowing up. What we found is a much less diverse community, only about 18 species. And when we looked at the most abundant species on pines, the most abundant fungi, all of them were found only on pine, not on our native trees. And all of them, when we looked at where they were from, were from other countries. They were all invasive in their own right. Um, there are a few species here that were uh, found on both pine and on the native beach. And these were sort of cosmopolitan species, species that are native to New Zealand, but are also found overseas. So thinking about that data, what we put together was this framework. Uh, what we've looking at the quantity of mycorrhizal fungi found on the native trees and the non-native trees. And what we showed was that the native fungi were diverse, really abundant community on our native beach, but no evidence of them crossing over to the, to the pine. So no evidence of what we'd call novel associations. There was this smaller group of cosmopolitan species. So those we termed familiar associations, meaning that they were um, native to New Zealand, but not new to pine. They actually occurred on pine in its home range as well. But the vast majority of mycorrhizae on pines are being driven by co-invasion of fungi um, with the pine. And the two fungi that come out as being the, the most important drivers are these two, Suilus luteus or sticky bun, really common fungus around the world. And then I'm gonna talk a lot more about this other one, which is called Cystotrema. It's a very small white crust on pine needles and to the best of my knowledge has only been collected once, despite it being incredibly important during uh, through the invasion. We've only seen the sporocarp once and that was in North America. So is this process of co-invasion unique to pines? Does it show up on other countries? So I'll show you just a little bit of data from other species. This is work by Holly Moeller, who was doing her PhD at Stanford at the time. She came down and looked at Douglas fir. Douglas fir is interesting, it's shade tolerant, so it can invade under our native forest. It can also invade under plantations of Douglas fir and also out into grasslands. She looked across all three of those habitats. And to make a long story short, it very strongly confirmed the co-invasion idea. Douglas fir is able to form novel associations with endemic mycorrhizal fungi, but the most dominant associations she found were always with non-native invasive fungi. And particularly in this case, a uh, fungus called rhizopogon, which is quite host specific to, the, uh, to Douglas fir. We had another student come down, Laura Bogar, who was collaborating with Peter Kennedy and I, and she looked at uh, invasive alder and willow, which are also ectomycorrhizal trees. And again, to make a long story short, found very different communities on, on two different rivers on the two different species, but 100% of those fungi were non-native. So every single fungus coming in was, was a, a co-invading fungus. She found quite a diverse community on the willow. And then interestingly on the, on the alder, again, a very restricted community, only about three really dominant species, including alnicola, which is a, a, again, a very highly specialized fungus on alder. So taken as a whole, I'd say that co-invasion is quite clearly the major driver of tree invasions that we're seeing. It involves many different fungi, depending on what tree species it is. But um, much to my surprise, actually, it's typically driven by host specialists which sort of contradicts what you might think from, from ecological theory. Mm. 
So then the question is, how are the funky getting there? Um, if, if we start thinking about this invasion as being driven in the case of pine by Swillis, how is this Swillis getting out there? So this is work I did in collaboration with Jamie Wood and a number of other people where Jamie went out and put out night vision cameras focused on mushrooms. And there's the mushroom there in the shot. And here you can see if you're patient enough, there's a European red deer. Now remember there are no native uh, terrestrial mammals in New Zealand. All of our large mammals are introduced. So this is a European red, red deer, clearly seeking out and eating the mushroom. And here we have actually another mammal. This is an Australian brush-tailed possum, which is quite deliberately eating the gills. So it's getting quite a substantial load of spores off of this mushroom. So we knew that these, these animals were coming and eating the mushrooms, but were they actively dispersing them? So we went out and had long discussions about how to collect the feces of these animals as fresh as we could, got it collected, brought it back to the greenhouse, and we made a sort of slurry from that feces and then applied it to our native beech trees, to the invasive Pines contorta, and to Douglas fir. And the results were overwhelming. Neither deer nor possum resulted in any mycorrhization of our native beech trees. All the seedlings remained completely free of mycorrhizae. But both pine and Douglas fir were substantially enhanced in the number of mycorrhizae that they formed, and, the, and, and how many of them formed mycorrhizae, by either deer with about 20%, or particularly by the brush tail possum, which led to more than half of the pine and the Douglas fir seedlings becoming mycorrhizal. When we looked at the, the composition of species in the poo, so this is using DNA metabarcoding to look at what species of fungi are present, we found that those mammals are eating a wide range of fungi. So they're eating both the native and the non-native fungi. But if we look at the root tips of those seedlings and see what are they actively dispersing, it's only the non-native species. So, so the, they're consuming native fungi, but the spores are unable to pass through the mammalian gut. Mm -hmm. So what this suggests is that we should not be thinking about this invasion as being an invasion of trees, but rather the, as a co-invasion process of the trees, fungi that are allowing them to establish and these mammals that are dispersing those fungi. And interestingly, if you look at this system, it's a North American tree. Suillus, the particular one we've got here, is a European species of, of Suillus being dispersed by red deer, which is a European species. But the best disperser of all is the brush-tailed possum, which is Australian. So we've got literally a United Nations of invasive species contributing to the loss of our grasslands. So what does it matter? What is the effect of this co-invasion of fungi on these ecosystems? To understand this, we set out these gradients of pine density, looking from very open to uh, stands with just a few pines in them, all the way up to stands of pines so dense that you can't move through them. And this was work of a postdoc in my group, Sarah Sapsford, um, who's now in Australia. What she showed was when you looked at the community, there was a really predictable succession. So in this graph, I've got increasing amounts of pine across the x-axis, and then how different fungal species respond. And what you can see here, if it works for me, is that Suillus is there at the very start of succession. So it is clearly the, in, the initiator of pine establishment, allowing that, that invasion to get going. But after that, it tends to just persist at low level. It never dominates the community. Instead, it's this, this sort of odd fungus I'm terming cystotrema becomes the dominant player in, in the fungal community along with other fungi such as ammonita. Now, I keep being a bit cagey about cystotrema. The reason for that is that cystotrema is an absolute mess of a, of a genus. Um, it actually appears that that name applies to six different genera that spread across two different families. Um, this is just a phylogeny. Every blue group is a group that has named cystotrema in it. This red group at the top in the Hydnaceae is the one that we actually have in New Zealand. This causes enormous problems in bioinformatics um, because the cysto if you say you have cystotrema to the database, it comes back and says you have a saprotroph. Uh, the one we have is not a saprotroph, it's clearly actomycorrhizal, uh, but you have to correct the database to solve that. And if you look at the phylogeny of, of where our particular isolate comes from, these are all the sequences marked with flags from New Zealand. 
And you can see that they're all clustering with sequences from North America as being the closest match. Again, only once collected as a sporocarp, the closest other species being an Estonian sporocarp found on the base of a tree. Why am I so concerned with cystic trauma? Well, this is work by a student of mine, Vanita Thacker, who's just finished up her PhD thesis, and she was looking at the bacterial community of cystic trauma. This is an ordination, so it's just looking at how similar the communities were, and what you can see in the vast big area of the ordination are Ammonita, Suillus, and Chalcipras, three different fungal species, no differentiation in the bacteria, and the bacterial community was actually very much like the bulk soil. But when we looked at those root tips that were colonized by cystotrema, they formed this incredibly dense cluster in the ordination, suggesting that this fungus is structuring the, the bacterial community in a way that no other fungus does. There's also some uh, evidence from genomes of related fungi that should have a really distinctive genome from other species. Unfortunately, because we haven't gotten it in culture, we, we do not yet have a genome to study that. What we can do, though, is look at what happens when you change the ecosystem and then correlate that back to cystotrema. So again, this is work by Sarah Sapsford. What Sarah did was set out plat plots where pine had been actively removed. And she had those that had been removed anywhere from 1 to 13 years ago, and then at varying densities. And she did a ton of work on this, and I'm not doing her justice because I'm only giving her one more slide on this. But this is a, a sort of overwhelming summary of everything she found. Um, she looked at different enzymes. These are these three blue boxes. And she found there were three sort of major axes of enzyme activity. Those involved in, in sort of cellu cellulose degradation, lactase and acid phosphatase, and then manganese peroxidase, which is incredibly important in the breakdown of lignin. And wherever you see a pink box, that's a link between pines and the time since removal and density through the fungal community. And I know that's too hard to see, for, so I'll just put pictures into it. In every single case, cystotrema came up as being the most important determinant of what the effect of pines on soil enzyme activity was. So there's really good evidence that, that pines are changing the behavior of soil and they're doing it through the fungal community. So what are the consequences? One of them, one of the most consistent ones is we see a mining of soil organic material. So in pine invasion, very, very quickly as pine invasion starts to accumulate biomass, we see a loss of about 20% of the soil carbon. And this pattern has been seen not only in New Zealand, but also in South America. We also see it in pine plantations. So it seems to be a very universal pattern of pines to sort of break down organic molecules out of the soil. We also see that when we look at nutrients. So we don't see any change in total nutrients, or at least not much. We see a slight decline in total phosphorus in the blue on the left-hand side and a slight increase in the carbon to nitrogen ratio, but not, not huge. But what's interesting is we put the soils through something called a Headley fractionation. It's a 14-step um, extraction of, of phosphorus that goes from the most available to the least available. And what we see is that as pines invade, as the biomass of pines increases, there's a strong decline in three of the most unavailable, most recalcitrant pools of phosphorus, um, the, the, both of them being the sodium hydroxide organic extracts from soil and the residual P, which is what's left in the bottom of the beaker after you've tried everything to get the phosphorus out of it. At the same time as those pools are going down, it's actually shifting that phosphorus into highly available pools, soluble phosphorus, and the most uh, readily taken up pools of phosphorus for plants. We also see a really surprising shift in the, in the trophic dominance of soils. Looking at both PLFA and particularly at nematodes, nematodes are great little animals. You can look at their mouth parts and determine what they eat. And so this was worked by Gregory Yates, who looked at these mouth parts, classified them all up again as a function of tree biomass. And what he showed, oh, sorry, what he showed was that with increasing tree biomass, there's an incredible increase in bacterial feeding nematodes relative to fungal feeding nematodes. That matters, sorry, because bacterial energy channels are very fast turnover. 
It's as if you take the same amount of nutrients and you're cycling it much, much more quickly because when nutrients go into a bacterium, that bacterium rapidly gets eaten by something and those nutrients are released. Fungi tend to sequester nutrients. And we see that signature in coming back to the plant community. So sort of closing the cycle back to the plant community. This is looking at um, different areas of, of pine legacies. We have over here on the right, a native dominated area where they kept pines out completely. We had another plot where it was dominated by pines. Pines have been allowed to invade, invade. And what we see is a shift in the plant community. These sort of green codes are all the native species that had been present. When it moves over to a pine community, it becomes dominated by pine. Very few natives are able to persist. But when you remove the pine, rather than shifting back to that original native community, you shift to an entirely new ecosystem dominated by exotic grasses and exotic forbs. Now that could be because of several reasons. Um, there's a lot going on there. There's disturbance in the removal. There's disturbance that led the pine and maybe the pines were on those sites because of some pre-existing condition. So this is where my student Joanna Green comes in. What she did is actually used mesocosm soils where she actually controlled whether they had pines or exotic grasses or a different number of alien species in the first phase, and then looked at the effect on both pine and grass growth and other species. What Joanna was able to show was that when you looked at the legacy soils, that is a soil that's had pine in it, you see an, that pine seedlings prefer that soil. We have a positive feedback. Pine soils make pines grow larger. That's not surprising. We kind of expect that one. She also showed that a pine legacy soil increases the growth of grasses, particularly alien grass species. So we see they're increased in biomass when there has been pine present. And those alien species themselves make the soil more favorable for a pine. So the more alien species, we had the greater proportion of the community that was made up of alien species from zero to 100%, the more likely it was that a pine seedling would go into sort of upper biomass group. So what you've got here is a feedback cycle where pine is facilitating exotic invasives. So when you remove the pine, it tends to come up to other invasive species and those alien species are in turn making the site more prone to pine invasion. So I would suggest that we cannot start, we cannot continue to think of these as plant invasions. We have to embrace this complexity mm -hmm. that we can't think about single species, but we instead have to think about the multi-trophic interactions of the plants, their associated fungi, the animals that are dispersing those fungi and feeding on them, the changes in bacterial and fungal ratios in the soil and the soil mesofauna and, and, and microbes that are eating each other and cycling those nutrients, making them available to plants and how that feeds back to other plants that we're not even considering such as exotic grasses. That's all very depressing. So what does it mean in terms of management? Um, I would suggest that as much as we value these in these grasslands that really define the character of New Zealand. People come from all around the world to see this wide open landscape. It was induced by human burning. It's probably not sustainable. It, it was forest before, and it probably effectively wants to be forced. So invasive woody plants do very well. The, so our iconic novel ecosystems are increasingly going to give way to invasion. We are investing a vast amount of money in pine control operations. We probably have the largest investment in, in wilding control of any country in the world. We're putting in between 10 and $35 million a year, depending on the year. We are spraying herbicide from helicopters at levels that are twice the legal rate, a mixture of triclopyr, perchloram, dicamba, and aminopyrolids, which is a uh, pretty horrendous mix. It's, and we are having issues with it showing up in our river. So we, it's both expensive and bad for the environment. But the reason we're doing that is we have had a cost benefit analysis. And this is so important to do in other countries to look at the return on investment of removing pines. And it's probably the best investment you could ever make. We are we get back $34 for every dollar we invest in wilding pine management. And the reason for that is, is multifold, but it's due to saving agricultural land, 
There is a component of that that's due to biodiversity, but the biggest component is due to water. The pine sucks, pine sucks the water out of the system and we depend on that water for irrigation we also are a country that generates most of our power from hydroelectric, so the loss of that water through pine invasion would be truly catastrophic. The problem for us is we spend all that money, and five years later, this is what it looks like. You can see this is an actual invasion sprayed by a helicopter with that mixture of chemicals, and all through among those dead trees, you can start picking out individual trees that have survived. It's actually been between five and 10% of the trees are able to survive the initial spray, um, often just a few branches, but they come back quite quickly. And then in the foreground, you see this extensive recruitment of pine seedlings. That's particularly problematic because reinvasion is different from invasion. That initial invasion, the plants are struggling to get mycorrhizae. They tend to establish patchily small individual trees widely dispersed in the landscape that then become little focal points of invasion. But once the pines have been there and you remove them, the reinvasion is coming in as a carpet of pine seedlings covering the landscape as far as you can see. So what are the management implications from that? I think um, in terms of control operations, you have to understand that there are two goals of control. One is to prevent spread. And that is the most critically important goal is to keep the pines on a site from spreading to additional sites because once they're there, it starts a feedback cycle. But you also have to recognize that the local gains of management, that is the, what you're doing on a particular site, those gains are very short-lived because of the reinvasion cycle. As I suggested, I don't think we can continue to simply maintain it the way it has been for all of our lifetimes, um, excepting in a few rare ecosystems and above native natural tree line where probably we have to have ongoing management. Instead, the focus of the research we're doing now is on restoration and what whether we can harness the cover provided by pines, harness the increased nutrients that pines make available to restore it back to a sort of pre-human state, pre-1200, um, hoping that the shade of native trees will be enough to keep pines from reinvading. So with that, that's sort of a quick summary of where we've been with this research and um, the New Zealand situation. I just want to quickly acknowledge my funding from various sources and the fact that all this research, um, which is a lot to, to shove into a quick talk, is, is the output of a huge team of people. And with that, I will end. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ricky. Your talk was quite interesting. And uh, yeah, I, I did not know the pine is uh, so invasive and also they associated with the uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi. It, yeah. It's also very surprising. And uh, yes, and uh, Amanita muscaria is uh, yes, common in Japan too. <laughs> and uh, it, maybe... We have the same kind of system in Japan, even in Japan. Yeah, um, no, in fact, the Ammonite muscaria that we have DNA matches to the Japanese isolate. It's one of the more curious. We don't know why we would have the Japanese Ammonite muscaria, but it, in fact, it did almost perfect match to the Japanese one. Um, but yeah. for us, that's an interesting one. It tends to come late in the invasion, but it's um, it's probably the most generalist of the fungi, we see it on almost every um, invasive ectomycorrhizal tree. Oh, I see. So the, we have a question from the audience. Yes, we do have one question oh. so oh. far. Um, so the question is, how do environmental variables impact on the growth of mushroom or fungi uh, diversity? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, you would expect that it would have a huge effect, but in fact, um, it doesn't seem to. So Suilis, the fungus that we find driving the invasion front, is not only driving it in New Zealand, it's also driving the pine invasion in Hawaii. It's also driving the pine invasion in Argentina. We also see it in Chile. And so um, it seems to be incredibly indifferent to the environment that is found in. I've seen it in lowlands. I've seen it at the top of mountains where the mushroom is nearly taller than the trees it associates with. Um, so, yeah. 
Okay, thanks. Karl Josef, do you have a question? Yes. Um, thank you very much. Very enlightening talks. Uh, I have a two part question. The so first one is um, Do you get rid of these uh, mycorrhizal uh, fungi again if you delete the pine? Or after introducing these fungal invasive species, you never get them rid again? Uh, so maybe it's the second one. And my Second part of the question would be, what is then your recommendation for monitoring alien invasive species? You are saying that we have to monitor um, the, the soil, uh, mycorrhizal, uh, microbiome very carefully in parallel to looking at the invasive plant species, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, a couple of things. One is... Uh... We have looked at the what happens when you remove the pine. It takes about two years for the fungal community to start depleting. So be, okay. they'll be present for a year or two. But unfortunately, Suiles, the um the one that drives the invasion front, after 15 years, it's still present in the soil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it sort of disassembles in the same order as it assembles or in the reverse order of the assembly. Um, your, your question was about, the second part was around um, Guidelines, recommendations. Yeah, I think probably the most important two that I would say is one would be that there may be plants that are not currently invasive, but that if the wrong fungus arrives could become invasive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we often consider that in terms of plant traits, that the traits, the phenotype of a plant is a product not just of the plant, but also of the, its associates of whatever fungi or bacteria or other organisms it, it um, has co-evolved with. The other one that one that concerns me quite a bit is when we move plants, we've got very clear biosecurity around the plant, but we don't have as good biosecurity around the soil and the associated microbes maybe on the plant. We look for disease symptoms, but even in New Zealand where we've got very strict biosecurity laws, there's still a sort of um, blindness to the movement of soil. So we put huge effort to eco-source plants and make sure that we're using genotypes from the local region. And then we grow them in a centralized nursery with commercial compost from a city um, that is full of non-native fungi. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I'd like to see more attention is thinking about the whole system of what you bring into an area you're trying to restore. Mm -hmm. so. May I ask one more, sorry, Noriaki. So what is the affected area in New Zealand. So you cannot do it manually, I understand. You have hmm. uh, well, you saw the maps, how, how much area of pine yeah, we have is. How many thousands, millions, whatsoever square uh, I think it's 7% of the country. Okay, seven, yeah. So it's, it's beyond, and a lot of that territory is uh, yeah. very challenging terrain, very mountainous, very rough terrain, so. Mm. Okay, uh, uh, Ravinda. Yeah, uh, it was a very, very interesting talk, uh, Dr. Dickey. Uh, you mean to say that uh, fungus follows pines or pines follow fungus? Good question. For invasion, <laughs> for invasion as I could yeah. understand the talk that uh, fungus is there, the pines can come and establish. Yeah, that's, that, don't fungus, know the fungus, end. Fungus don't comes. Know the end. Um, it's possible that the fungus is dispersing in either as spores or in animal feces and then able to sit for a period and wait for a seedling to arrive. But plant seedlings can also survive, depending on the species, up to two or three years off of seed reserves. And so we've seen a situation we've seen the situation where the uh, trees can start to grow and they look terrible. They're chlorotic, they're yellow, they're barely growing. In some cases, they're getting smaller every year. They sort of die back every year further and further. And then when the fungus arrives, they can take off. Don't, so you, think both that it is the, don't you think that it is the multi-species microbial consortium that stabilizes the pines? Multi-species? Um, microbial? Yeah, I'm not sure. I... I it would be the evidence we have is it doesn't take many. Mm -hmm. It's sufficient to have just Suilis. And if Suilis is present, 
that's all pine needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Can, can I just one ha have one question as well? Thanks, Ian, for this great talk. Um, just because I think it's also connecting what we're discussing already. So how this is all how this all started in the seventies? You showed a publication where they just actually couldn't grow any pines mm -hmm. in New Zealand. Did I get this right? So this would, you know, uh, what is your suggestion? What happened in the meantime, within 50 years, that invasion now is so drastic and, you know, pines couldn't be grown 50 years ago. Yeah, no, there were unfortunately very deliberate efforts to spread the fungi. Um, I can, I mean, in the case of um, Douglas fir, when I arrived in New Zealand, it was considered not invasive. That was about 20 years ago. And now we consider it to be one of our worst invasive species. And the reason for that was in the 1990s, a particular uh, person who was working for the forestry industry uh, realized that they weren't getting good growth from Douglas fir, and she spread the Rhizopogon inoculum into every tree nursery in the country. She, she shipped it around the country to get better growth. So single-handedly, it's quite amazing, single-handedly she created our second most valuable timber species um, in a country where, where timber is a huge industry, and she created one of our worst weeds. So if you don't think one person can make a difference, man, she showed that one person can definitely make a difference. So, Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so shall we move to the last speaker? Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vicky. So the last speaker uh, is uh, Professor Yoshida, Masahito Yoshida, University of Tsukuba. And the title of his talk is uh, Pathway Control of Inva Invasive Alien Species in Remote Islands, an example of Ogawasora Islands, a natural world heritage Japan. Uh, Professor Yoshida, would you start whenever you're ready? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Yoshida uh, the, from University of Tsukuba, and I'm also a member of the Invasive Alien Species Group of the IUCN and a member of the Scientific Council of Ongasawara Natural World Heritage. Mm -hmm. And today I would like to uh, introduce the uh, example of pathway control of um, invasive alien species in Ongasawara Island. Uh, natural world heritage area in Japan. Uh, Ongasawara Island, a uh, remote island uh, located 1,000 kilometer south of Tokyo. And there are no uh, airports in Ongasawara Island. So we have to cruise 24 hours from Tokyo to Ongasawara Island, very remote island. Uh, there are uh, more than 30 uh, islands, but only two islands, Chichijima and Hahajima, are inhabited by human beings. And the Ongasawara Islands are oceanic islands that have never been connected with the continent or Japanese archipelago uh, more than 40 million years. So the uh, invasive alien species or the endemic species as well uh, have to fly or using wave or uh, uh, fly themselves and uh, uh, to migrate to the, the islands. And Ongasawara uh, Island is inscribed on the World Heritage List in 2011 because uh, under the Criterion 9, ongoing evolutionary process of plants and animals. Uh, but uh, now, uh, uh, Ongasawara Islands is threatened by the invasive alien species. Uh, this is an example of the endemic species that all plants and the animals uh, migrate the, to Ongasawara Islands by wave, wind, and wing. Among 441 vascular plants, 161 species, 37%, are endemic. Among 138 woody plants, 88 species, 64% are endemic. Uh, uh, Rosewood is one of the uh, woody plants endemic to Ongasawara. 
uh, among 1,380 insects, uh, 379 species, 28% are endemic. But many insects, uh, including dragonflies, butterflies, and beetle, became endangered uh, because of the invasion of uh, alien species. Uh, for example, uh, this butterfly, uh, Celestina omasaurensis, is uh, almost extinct. We never seen this uh, butterfly since 2018. And among many species, the uh, land snails, uh, we have many land, uh, endemic land snails, uh, among 104 land snails, 98 species, 94% are endemic to Omasawala. And we can witness the uh, ongoing adaptive radiation of land snails in uh, islands of Omasawala. Uh, this fact justifies the reason why Ungasawala Island are inscribed on the World Heritage List. And for example, uh, this species, Mandarina, uh, is adapted to the to live on a, a leaf. And this species uh, has been uh, adapting to uh, live on the ground. But the uh, many endemic species are threatened by the uh, invasion of the alien species. I would like to introduce the, some example of invasive alien species. Uh, Omasawa Island was uh, settled uh, in 1830s. Uh, since then, to, until the 1945, the end of the war, uh, many plants and animals are introduced by human beings, such as uh, bishop wood uh, or a lead tree. Yeah, these are typical uh, uh, introduced uh, woody plants in Omasawala Island, the, uh, especially uh, bishop wood, bishop yajabanica, are uh, grown bigger and bigger, and they uh, make a shadow uh, and uh, and the endemic plants cannot survive under the heavy shadow. And uh, within animals, wild goat, uh, wild pig, feral cat, black rat, and brown rats are typical uh, invasive alien species. Uh, and after the war, uh, many animals were introduced uh, uh, to Ogasawa Island, uh, especially uh, during the period of 1945 to 1968, because the, after the war, uh, the uh, Ogasawa Islands was occupied by the U.S. Army, and so uh, many uh, alien species are introduced during this period. For example, green anole, uh, anolis carolinensis, uh, is the uh, native to North America, but introduced uh, through Guam Island. And the uh, green anole is a big predator for the insects of Ongasawa Island. And the can carnivorous flatworm, Pratidiumis uh, manaquari, or and big headed ant, Pedo uh, megacephala. And it's a big predator for the land snail. And of course, uh, we carried out the uh, eradication program of the uh, alien species, but the uh, scientific council gave advice uh, to uh, very careful the order of the, in, in the eradication. Uh, for example, the, in, the ca uh, in case of the eradication program in Ototojima, the, and there are two major uh, invasive species, wild pig and wild frog. Uh, but if we in, uh, in, uh, eradicate a pig first, the eradication pig is easier than uh, eradication frog. But uh, if we uh, eradicate the pig first, the uh, population of frog will be bigger and bigger. 
and the dragonfly, uh, endemic dragonfly will be uh, 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 ended. So uh, we eradicate frog first, and then uh, eradicate pig after that. So uh, we uh, we have to uh, take uh, consider the food chain of the uh, animals. And another example of eradication of the uh, alien species is feral cat, uh, red headed wood pigeon, uh, Colomba gentiana, uh, is threatened by the feeding of the feral cats in uh, until 2007, and uh, the population of uh, red headed wood pigeon is. Uh, uh, estimated less than 100 at that time. So, and then uh, Ministry of Environment and the non-profit organization uh, started the program of eradication. And that time uh, they uh, hosted the uh, international workshop to for saving the uh, lead-headed uh, wood pigeon in 2007 uh, to invite a specialist from IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature, and then uh, they resulted that uh, they have to um, eradicate the uh, feral cats in the wild, as well as strengthen the management of the cats in a village and not to increase the, the number of feral cats. However, the, uh, if we kill the cats, the, there are a lot of criticism from cat lovers, so uh, we decided to not to kill the cats and send cats uh, to the Tokyo Veterinarian Association alive. And more than 300 cats are sent uh, by boat to Tokyo and veterinarian uh, uh, tamed the uh, feral cats as a pet and find uh, new host. And uh, this uh, humanitarian uh, treating of the cats is highly evaluated by IUCN. Uh, and the, uh, the finally, uh, the uh, number of field cats decreasing and the dead headed wood pigeon uh, has been increasing. Now we can see the uh, many young uh, wood pigeon uh, individual, even in a, a town. So uh, this is one of the successful story of the eradication of invasive species. But uh, this example is not successful. And uh, the expansion of the green anole. Uh, actually, green anole population is uh, limited to the uh, only in inhabited islands. Chichijima and Hajima. However, in 2013, we observed a very small population in Anijima Islands, uninhabited islands, and uh, uh, islands uh, uh, that is home to very important, very rare uh, insects. And uh, so uh, we um, uh, immediately uh, declare the emergency uh, in the uh, uh, scientific council of Wasawara Water Heritage and the Ministry of Environment and the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, uh, together with the other agencies, uh, they started the uh, eradication program of the Green Ano in Anijima Island, uh, including the establishment of the fence through the island to stop the expansion and uh, uh, put the many uh, sticky trap on a tree to catch the uh, uh, green and all. And however, uh, up to now, we could not stop the expansion of the uh, green and all to northward. Another example is uh, ex uh, alien species, the big headed ants, uh, Feido uh, megacephala. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, ants 
it originated from Africa, but uh, uh, this species expanded on many islands in the Pacific Island, the Pacific Ocean. So uh, I'm not sure how uh, these ants come to uh, Chijima Islands, but uh, this ants uh, distribution is only limited to Chijima Island, uh, which is the uh, inhabited islands. However, in 2014, we uh, observed a very small population of uh, big-headed ants in Hahajima Island, other uh, uh, inhabited islands. Uh, but immediately, the Ministry of Environment started the eradication program to invite ants with uh, 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 food and kill them. Uh, this program is uh, almost completed. Uh, however, uh, uh, as we have many uh, uh, alien ants in a, a Tokyo uh, port of the Tokyo Bay, so we are afraid that the and other uh, alien ants, like uh, fire ants or Arzenche ants, will be uh, introduced to Ongasawara Islands. So we need the pathway control, not to focus on the specific species, but we need a pathway, a stop the pathway of the uh, alien species. For example, as you can see the picture uh, in below uh, in Tokyo Bay, uh, the, uh, there are a lot of cargo ship uh, that brings uh, the uh, cargo from Tokyo Bay to Wasawara Islands, and they use the wood wood uh, wood made uh, pallet uh, to bring cargo to to the ship. So uh, that the, that risks the uh, invasion of the uh, alien ants from Tokyo Bay to Wasawara Islands. So prevention of the new alien species is next step, very important program. Another pathway uh, of alien species is uh, tourism. So uh, to stop the expansion of the carnivorous flatworm, uh, carnivorous flatworm is now currently limited to the Chichijima Islands, inhabited islands, uh, but we would like to stop the expansion of this carnivorous flatworm. So uh, the uh, tour tourists are encouraged to clean up their shoes uh, with using the uh, brush and uh, sp uh, spray vinegar spray uh, to kill the flatworm. And uh, when they get on and get off the ship, and uh, when they go into the habitat of the important endemic species they are required to clean up the sh their shoes using the brush and uh, spray of the vinegar. Uh, but, uh, however, uh, we could not stop the uh, spread of the carnivorous ratum uh, within uh, uh, Chichijima Island. So most of the Chichijima Island uh, already invaded by the rat ratum. Uh, but uh, uh, we have to stop the um, uh, further uh, invasion of the platform to other islands. Another uh, pathway of invasion is, is agriculture. The farmers live in Hahajima Island. I would like to uh, import the uh, plants like uh, mango uh, from uh, Okinawa Islands. Okinawa Islands is uh, uh, southwest islands of uh, Japan, uh, close to Taiwan. Uh, so uh, they they already have uh, many uh, uh, invasive species. So we are uh, very careful to uh, stop the new invasion of species, uh, alien species. So uh, the Ministry of Environment. Uh, recently introduced the basing of plant pots uh, to kill the soil animals. 
uh, if we uh, uh, in, uh, use uh, a basin of hot water, uh, we can kill the uh, invasive uh, cannibalous flat worm, uh, as you can see in a uh, picture above. And the picture below is uh, the how uh, the uh, Ministry of Environment uh, use the basin, hot water basin for the uh, plant uh, plant pot. The another pathway is uh, public work, and uh, within uh, within a public work process, many uh, gears and uh, materials are uh, bring from Tokyo to Ogasawara Island. So. Uh, we asked the, the company uh, who involved in uh, public work uh, to follow the guideline. We developed the guideline for public works uh, last year. And uh, the uh, company who uh, involved in the public works have to uh, check before they load the materials on a boat or vehicles. And uh, and uh, vehicle itself uh, should be cleaned up, um, especially clean up the soil. Uh, the soil may contain some uh, ants and uh, rat worm. So uh, I hope the uh, all the company uh, follow this guideline and to stop the new invasion of the avian species. The last pathway is uh, pets. Uh, Ongasawara village already have an ordinance to control the, the uh, pets, including cats and uh, dogs. But uh, Ongasawara uh, village uh, assembly recently adopted a new ordinance to stop the introduction of new invasive alien animals to Ongasawara Island. And those who keep dogs and cats have to register to the village uh, and uh, to put the uh, small uh, the micro tip inside the, the under the skin and to identify who is the owner of the dog and the cat. And uh, those who would like to bring any animals uh, to this island and uh, uh, they have to apply for the village, but the most of the oriental uh, animals uh, cannot be uh, registered. They uh, they are not uh, allowed to bring any other uh, uh, oriental animals. In summing up, so uh, uh, we have. Uh, two strategy for inhabited islands and uh, uninhabited islands. But for the inhabited islands, uh, Anichijima and uh, Hahajima, appropriate keeping of the animals by villagers and the cooperation of tourists is uh, very important to prevent the spread of the invasive alien species. And in other inhabited islands, the eradication of existing invasive alien species, such as uh, rats and green anoles, is also important. And the prevention of further introduction of invasive alien species through public works are essential. Uh, so, uh, uh, that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Yoshida. <laughs> uh, it, it's quite impressive talk. And Simon, do we have uh, some questions from the audience? Not yet. Uh, not uh, yet. So and uh, do, do the panelists have some questions or comments uh, to the Professor Yoshida? Okay, Carl, just Carl, Joseph. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so an entirely different scale compared to Dickie's pine invasion. Um, so maybe it's the same question first. What is the area of this island? My more specific uh, question is, 
the eradication of the big headed ants. That was done manually somehow. You search for the colonies and then you just spread some anti and uh, I don't know, uh, chemi chemicals, and so you eradicate it. So the advantage was that this uh, big headed ant lives in colonies. So it's quite easy to, to find them and to eradicate them. That's right. So the two questions, what is the size of the island? Yeah, yeah. Second. yeah. The fourth, uh, first question and the area of the island is uh, in total uh, 7,000 hectares, yeah. about 7,000 7, hectares. Thank you. Uh -huh. And uh, mm, uh, the colony, uh, it depends on the species. For example, the uh, uh, Argentine ant are uh, colonized in a, uh, in a cargo, so we can see uh, easily uh, to find the, the, their colony and attack them. And uh, but uh, in case of the uh, le uh, big-headed ants, so uh, it, it um, we we cannot find the uh, colony. So. Uh, we use the chemicals, and they uh, chemicals are, are inside a bait. So they bring the uh, uh, chemicals to their nest, and the other uh, ants will be died with the mm -hmm. chemical. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Hello, nice, nice talk, Dr. Yoshida. I was uh, wondering that uh, in your presentation, you shared that uh, in this uninhabited island of uh, Ogasawara, there are only two plants which were introduced by man, uh, Bischofia and uh, Lucina leucocephala. Uh, no, uh, I show just an uh, uh, example of the example. Uh, plant okay. species. Uh, actually, we have many, many uh, introduced species. No, but but why why was these introduced by man Lucina and Sophia uh, for for example sake? Yeah, uh, because the, uh, the, these plants are introduced uh, before the war. Uh, the actually population uh, now currently uh, the population of Ongasawara Islands human population is two thousand five hundred, but uh, before the war we uh, we have more than. 7,000 people live in the uh, Wasawa Islands. So they need fuels. So they, uh, for using the fuels, they introduce such kind of woody plants uh, before the war. So, and after the war, the Japanese cannot uh, be, come back to this island for more than 20 years. So uh, uh -huh. the woody plants become group grew up a very big and make uh, uh, become a very big uh, uh, invasive species and make a shadow or uh, the cover or the forest yeah. uh, thank you thank you now i could understand that these uh, island this island is uh, uninhabited after the mm. war yeah otherwise earlier it, there were the population the human population there. Mm. Mm. yeah now i could see thank you so much good talk yeah, Natalie. Uh, I have a general question about this uh, dynamics of invasive species between island and, and continental land, because what you were describing that you are able to do with the island with the pathway control, I assume it might be difficult to do it in uh, continental lands. So maybe uh, I'd like to know what are the challenges and specificities of invasive species uh, versus uh, island versus continental lands. If it's mm. uh, you have all something to say about this, mm. yeah. Uh, uh, actually, in the uh, past, uh, oceanic islands uh, are never been connected with the continent, so uh, there are many endemic species compared with the continent islands. So. Uh, it is very important to stop, uh, control the pathway of the uh, invasive species. The fortunately, uh, there are no uh, 
uh, air, uh, airplane from between uh, Japan and the uh, Ongasawara Islands. So uh, it is uh, uh, only way to control of the invasive species is control the uh, cargo or and the tourism tourist uh, using the boat. So and the control of the transportation and the uh, baggage is uh, and the cargo is a very important way to control the invasive species. But then, would you think it's it's easier to deal with this when you are working in a in an island, or it's different mm -hmm. challenges in an island and in in a continental land? Because maybe the biodiversity is more fragile, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, actually, the uh, but uh, in Japan, the, we we have uh, both. Uh, oceanic islands and the continental islands. The continental islands are Okinawa, uh, which once connected to the uh, Chinese continent. So, and we have many uh, invasive species already in Okinawa. The uh, climate of Okinawa and Ogasawara is very similar. So, sometimes the uh, in, import from of plants from Okinawa to Ogasawara makes a big uh, issue of um, uh, invasive species. Yeah, Karl Yusuf. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've uh, a fine. I've not a final a question to all of you. So I understand naturally because I attended also this IPES meeting in Bonn uh, last year. Um, there is the assessment on alien invasive species that is now finished. But uh, you all three, you continue in some sort of task force, I understand, to assess after this IPES assessment has been completed, um, mm. the further development of this big issue, very important issue. And so I'm wondering whether your task force is part of IPES or part of CBD or entirely independent and you feed information according to demand to IPES and CBD and so on. So just a general question, how is this information, the knowledge, the guidelines, the recommendations um, spread to these intergovernmental, uh, let's say, uh, organizations? I don't know who, who wants to answer. You all are experts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. See, uh, what I understand at IPBS, that is top to bottom approach they have. They ask only the governments. I ask my government that I want to share my work with uh, IPBS. So they did not give any credit to it. Yeah. And IPBS, they do not recognize individuals, mm -hmm. individual scientists. They gather information only from the published work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. So, so this is this is I, I should not say lacunae, but it is it is a system in which uh, they ask only the government and governments. They have certain such you know issues which are more sometimes like political or the ministers. They they don't understand the ecological implications. They only look at the economic implications. So that way, there is this type of gap, I feel, uh, exists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So otherwise, uh, for bigger areas, bigger countries, the issues are very huge and very difficult. Many a times, even, uh, you know, the, uh, the projects, funding of the projects becomes difficult. And especially those, uh, I am much concerned that uh, there are four hotspot zones of the biodiversity hotspot zones. And we need to scan the whole area. It is a very difficult task. So that is why I always say that uh, we should be focusing only that there is no new invasion. Are those uh, invaded species which are less in number, we can control them. That is how I look at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about Professor Dickey? How about in, in New Zealand? 
But to be fair, I haven't been involved with any of the international consortium. I usually feed my results through other channels, I see. um, publication or through talking to colleagues who are involved in those. Um, I would second the suggestion that we spend too much time worrying about the already established inv invaders that are beyond control and not enough time just jumping on things as soon as they're seen we, um, to get rid of those invasions before they get started. But, Okay, how about you in Japan, Professor Yoshida? Uh, yes, I understand that IPBES already developed uh, the guidelines and um, uh, the report, and probably uh, our findings are uh, uh, introduced through the uh, IUCN uh, Species Survival Commission's uh, Invasive Alien Species Group uh, oh. to IPBES. However, the uh, in uh, invasive alien issue, and every day new findings are <laughs> found. Uh, like uh, uh, I'm very much uh, uh, interested in and uh, uh, invasive uh, uh, Dickie's presentation and uh, uh, co uh, invasion between uh, fungi and uh, uh, plants. So and uh, our uh, uh, my uh, uh, opinion, uh, rather than control the specific species, rather than uh, we, I uh, uh, suggest to uh, them, uh, uh, Minister of Environment, to control the pathway is more important. But uh, this kind of the uh, uh, suggestion is not reflected to our law, domestic law. So we need the more uh, research and suggestion implication to the uh, management and uh, administration. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Do okay, so um, <laughs> before not going too much over time, <laughs> Sorry, Noriaki. There's okay. one one last uh, question, or it's also I think it's a it's also a remark. And Ravinda, you, I think you in your talk you defined uh, what is a, a invasive species. But the person says sorry that I have joined late. It's a question for her, per perhaps all experts, and is of general interest. Uh, in context of defining invasive species, would you consider migration of Homo sapiens from Africa and direct or indirect replacement of all Neanderthal populations <laughs> from other continents uh -oh. as a classical case of invasion? Or is there a difference between a natural migration and competition between different species, especially during glo global climatic change and increased resource limitations and a forced introduction of species by humans into new areas? If so, how does it affect identification of invasive species? Gee, it is a very, very pertinent question. And many places I have asked this, uh, that whether those species which are naturally coming, should we call them as invader, invaders? Of course, looking at the term invasion, it means yes. If they start impacting the local vegetation or local biota, then it becomes a problem. Otherwise, homogenization is already there in the globe. Homo sapiens are already there everywhere. When I say that, uh, let's say, uh, let's say Indians, they have gone to other places. They were invited to come and settle because of the economic reasons. They established there and their more progenies started coming up there. When they started competing with the, with the locals, the problems they start. So the same is true when we talk of plants, the same is true when we talk of birds or fishes. Whenever there is an impact on the local, local biota, the problem comes. Otherwise in nature, there is a balance oscillatory mechanisms in, in the whole ec ecosystem. The things they get settled, the problem comes when the 
exotics, they overpower the natives. So, whichever way you talk of, if the natural or the site of origin is different and the site of establishment, then it means it is invasion. It is not necessarily true gun. It is otherwise also possible. Okay. So if, if you if you want to discuss, let us do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other thoughts? Uh, probably in, in the, our ancestors in Japan <laughs> will uh, migrate from uh, continent to Japanese archipelago about uh, 30,000 years ago. So uh, probably in the they import the rice to uh, Japan and they changed the many uh, fr flora in Japan. But uh, probably at that time, the uh, fauna and flora had many changed uh, immediately uh, many. But uh, uh, it uh, from from that time to until the nineteenth century. Uh, it, in the flora and fauna is stable, but after uh, 19th century, when Japan opened the door to foreign countries, uh, we import many uh, mm -hmm. alien species mm -hmm. to Japan. So it, it changed uh, the uh, ecosystem uh, mm -hmm. a lot. So uh, we have to uh, uh, separate the changes when we um, Homo sapiens move to other place and the current uh, globalization. So current globalization changed the uh, ecosystem of, uh, all over the world uh, very um, much. So we have to uh, 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 struggle with this change. Okay, yeah. thank you. Ian? Oh, of course, for us, human colonization is uh, much more recent. There, You can put your hand on individual trees that have been alive since before the first humans had foot in New Zealand, um, which is a stunning thing, you know, individuals that have been long. Uh, I think for me, the interesting question is, what do you do when a species was introduced, say, by Maori, um, mm -hmm. and is now only found in New Zealand, or, or most of the population is here? So the Pacific rat, uh, Gyore, is... Um, mostly found in New Zealand and is quite an endangered species, but it's not native. Huge cultural significance, really important, and we we're trying to preserve it, um, but also not a native species. So it's it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. But I would also add, we can begin to address that for plants and animals. For fungi, we are constantly wondering what's native, trying to figure out how long has something been here? How do we tell? What are the when you see a new pathogen outbreak, is it because of a change in the environment that's made an, a native pathogen become invasive or become problematic? Or is it a new pathogen invading? Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a constant struggle. Yes. Okay, thank you. Oh. So I think <laughs> we already passed the uh, end time. So Shall we end the, the, today's webinar? Okay. Yes, uh, maybe oh, I only, sh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I only yes. show what happens tomorrow. Oops, uh. Yeah, and I actually just put the link of the whole webinar series of this week into the chat. Uh -huh. If you're interested, just click on the link. Uh, it's the whole Science Policy and Biodiversity Forum this mm -hmm. week. So tomorrow at a later time point, so that may be difficult for New Zealand and Japan. Um, so at uh, three o'clock um, uh, Central European time, we have this very important topic, entirely different topic, uh, digital sequence information in biodiversity research and how to share benefits. So tomorrow you find it uh, in the internet. And I think this was a marvelous um uh, assembly of very important talks thank you so much uh sorry uh, i give it back to noriaki <laughs> thank you well thank you very much for attending the today's webinar so that's the end of the uh, today thank you very much yeah thank you thank, thank you. you thanks for joining